a little over a year from Asbury, a little over a year from all of those sort of things that we we talked about last year of happening, that convergence that we seem to to see with the move of God. What are you seeing abroad and now and and here and there that you go? Are you are you are you finding this is increasing? Is it staying the same? Is it waning? What's the spiritual climate out there? Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Pemberton, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about Ken's most recent ministry trip to Germany, and you hear about all of that. You have heard what happened in Armenia, and then he uh, went from there to Germany. So, Ken Gutenabend, how are you doing today? <laughs> Well, guten Abend, and I'm feeling uh, just a little bit tired uh, because I am just got home from Germany yesterday, and so uh, right now it's 3 o'clock in the morning over there. I, I had a good sleep on the plane ride home, but jet lag is always a bit of a dragon to tame whenever one travels internationally. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, we had a really good uh, trip to Europe. Uh, we started with a small team in Romania, and we're in Timisoara, which is where the revolution to overthrow the communist regime began. But to be clear, we were not engaged in any kind of political activity at all. We went there to share in a church and train the people. And uh, and then we left Romania after, I think it was five days. and Or was it six? Anyway, um, and then we went to Germany and we had a three-city tour. We went to Chemnitz, which was... Uh, formerly known as Karl Marx Stadt, or the city of Karl Marx. And it's in East, what was G East Germany, or the GDR, the German Democratic Republic, as it was once called. It's now, of course, part of just Germany when there was a reintegration after the uh, Iron Curtain came down. Uh, but anyway, Chemnitz was its original name, and it was renamed by the communists to Karl Marx Stadt. And there is still a very large, very large bust of Karl Marx that sits in one of the city center areas. We walked by it and the things that were written uh, behind it and on the building behind it were pretty shocking, uh, you know, that his teachings needed to go throughout the whole world, et cetera. So, um, and I we were told that the, uh, the spirit of Karl Marx continues to live on in the Chemnitz area, and there are still diehard communists, you know, lurking about. Uh, from there, we went to Speyer, which is a beautiful old city. Um, there is evidence of civilization there going back several thousand years. But the uh, Dom, which is the German word for cathedral, uh, in the center of the old city of Speyer, was uh, is the place, it's the resting place of several of the uh, Holy Roman emperors. And uh, it was at one time um, a beautiful, you know, inlaid cathedral in, of the Romanesque style. Um, it's, it's probably the best preserved Romanesque cathedral in the world. But... Uh, but unfortunately, when Napoleon invaded the area back roughly 200 years ago, um, he set the cathedral on fire after pillaging it, and a lot of the gold and other things that were on it, on the walls and whatnot, melted. And Napoleon's soldiers gathered all that together, and they took it all back to France. And so today, it's a rather plain-looking cathedral on the inside, but architecturally, it's still quite interesting because of the Romanesque style. And when you go down into the crypt area, um, this is where these various emperors are buried. And I think if I counted them right, there's nine of them down there. So uh, obviously, you don't see their bones. They're all of them in stone sarcophagi. Uh, but you can certainly walk by them and you can see the engravings on the top and you know, okay, that's where Conrad is and that's where Henry is and so on. So that was, um, that was stop two. Um, and then stop three, we went to the city of Essen, which is uh, about 
20% of all the people in Germany live in Essen, approximately. And uh, Essen is known for its steel mining and, excuse me, it's, it's iron ore mining and it's steel making. Um, and it, it, I've been in quite a few German cities over the years now, but uh, Essen is one of the larger ones in the country. But it's kind of like Los Angeles. It sort of sprawls and you've got these various neighborhoods that adjoin one another and it all kind of runs together. So in in Romania, in Chemnitz and in Essen, all three of these cities wanted us to teach on deliverance, which is really challenging to do when you're doing it in two languages and your time is constrained because everything takes twice as long to say. It's difficult. And any preacher who, who's ever you know, done any preaching for any length of time knows what it is when you get on a roll, you feel like you're in the zone. Hard to do when you've got a translator because you say a sentence, you got to stop. Say another sentence, you got to stop. Sometimes you might say two sentences, but you can't just get on a roll. And so you have all of those challenges. And then what if your translator doesn't do a really good job of translating? Now, fortunately, I had good translators, but there's always that risk that something gets misinterpreted or not understood well. Um, the, the third stop of the four cities was, was in Speyer, where the cathedral is, or the Dom. And um, there they'd asked me to teach on sexual brokenness. So we taught on that. And uh, we had some just remarkable things went on uh, in all four of the cities we visited. Just remarkable. I mean, we had we had a plethora of healings, a plethora, I think is the right way to say it, a plethora of healings um, and some miraculous healings that, that went along. Of course, there were some who didn't get healed, but um, in all of these places, we saw very, very dramatic deliverances and people who had been caught in whatever form of bondage you might want to talk about. Now, obviously, the focus when we were in Speyer was on sexual brokenness. Uh, so sexual bondage was at the top of the list. But in every place we went, we were running into people who, whatever it was, they'd been tabling in Eastern religions, which are if anything, more popular there than they are in the United States. Uh, they had been engaging in hexerei, which is the German word for witchcraft. And we had quite a few very powerful uh, witchcraft deliverances. Um, people, many of them were in despair. And so they were cutting, they were uh, taking antidepressant drugs. Um, so we had a lot of deliverance around those kinds of issues. And particularly in Romania, but I wouldn't say Germany was exempt. It was just even more pronounced in Romania. There was an, a lot of uh, deliverance going on from uh, past sexual excess. Now, I'm using that as its own category. It could logically be grouped together with what we euphemistically call sexual brokenness. But sexual brokenness, we were using that as a cipher uh, because of the political climate in Europe. Um, we were using that as a cipher for people who may be serially immoral or homosexually inclined or practicing homosexuals. Um, when in the meeting that we did in Spire, we had a, a young woman present who had been in Romania. And when we'd been in Romania, I'd spent I don't know, quite a bit of time with her one night. I'm not, I wasn't really watching the clock, but it was probably at least an hour and a half, might've been two hours uh, in the front of the room where everybody could see what was going on. And I had somebody with me. So everyone can know this is on the up and up. There was nothing uh, inappropriate going on, but she was uh, in her late twenties and she got a ton of deliverance from all of her past experiences in life. And of her own volition, she decided she was going to come across and join us in Spire. Well, when she showed up, she had another woman with her. And this other woman had been um, a lesbian, a bisexual, uh, depending on which way she was identifying at the time. She'd been a prostitute. 
Um, and a part of her deliverance was the decision to get rid of all of the very expensive uh, clothing that she had for when she was plying her trade. Uh, but was, but was, I mean, she had this second woman. I, I prayed for her the first night. She had a massive manifestation in the middle of the ministry time and I drove some demons out of her. But what was more interesting perhaps was that the second day I handed her off to some of the team and she ended up taking out all of her piercings and all of the other body art that she could. Now her tattoos didn't go away. Uh, but she got deliverance from the de demons in her tattoos. And afterwards, she came up, thanked us for everything that had happened and said that this has been the most life transforming thing she'd ever had. She'd been a patient in the German mental health system for many, many years. Um, you should you should have seen her arm. She looked like a zebra from all the cutting. And I asked her if she had uh, cut her abdomen and legs because this is common with cutters. And she said, yes, she had. Um, she'd been raped a number of times. Uh, we drove out all the rape demons. And she didn't even look the same at the end of the event. Um, and she was she was begging us to come back soon. Wow. So, I mean, that was just a, it was, it was, it was almost a Gadarene demoniac kind of uh, level of freedom that came to her. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just a glorious ex uh, example of the kingdom of God breaking in. We also had um, one uh, session with a woman who had multiple personalities and we got, uh, I started with her, we ran out of time. The next day I gave one of our team members uh, the lead on that. And when I checked in, they and I, and I said to the team member, here's how I would handle this. This is what I would do. Uh, this is what I think your issues are gonna be. Boom, 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 boom. So the team member uh, took that, and when I checked in, all the personalities had been integrated. And so this woman was no longer multi TID, as we say, a dissociative identity disorder. Uh, there was another man who, uh, he had he'd blown up his marriage, and he couldn't forgive himself for that. And he was able to put all that to rest, and he had a, a tremendous reconciliation with his wife. So, I mean, the kingdom of God was in evidence in, in, a, in a huge way. And in every city where we went, the stories were a little different. In Romania, we were dealing with a lot of witchcraft and former communism and immorality. When we were chemnitz, the communism piece was much larger. But there was a lot of immorality in chemnitz as well. Uh, because when there's no belief in God, many times people will do whatever they feel like. Sure. And so uh, in, in any uh, former communist area, you will find that there is a higher than normal incidence of sexual immorality, heterosexual immoral immorality. And certainly we found that in Chemnitz. So we, you know, we dealt with a lot of that there and a lot of unforgiveness and bitterness towards the former communist government and what it had done to them as a people. Um, when we were in Spire, again, it was a lot of things dealing with uh, lesbianism, gay lifestyles, uh, bisexuality. I don't think we had anybody in the meeting who was transgendered. If, we, if that was there, I didn't hear about it. Um, and then when we ended up in Essen, what was really interesting there is uh, we ran into a lot of religious spirits coming out of the German pietist movement. And so, you know, each, each stop had its own unique emphasis. I'm not saying it was 100% what I've described in each of these cities, but there was a tendance, there was a trend line that was kind of leaning in one way. But everywhere we went, the Lord just move marvelously and um the one thing i want to say though that that perhaps would be unexpected for a lot of people is that we had uh, a number of these healings and deliverances um, the prayer sessions lasted um, up to five hours some of them were 
only three or four, and many of them ran to one and a half to two hours, many of them. So a lot of people were waiting for their time to get prayer. And of course, people were begging for appointments. So I you know, kept farming out the team to go do these prayer appointments with people. So we were able to process a lot of people because we had a pretty good team that was large and, and pretty well trained. But, um, but I don't want anyone to think that what I'm describing is every single one of these was, you know, Shaba Baba, boo, and it was over. There was a lot of um, the care of souls, kind of deep conversation around how did things get to where they are. Um, again, the Lord broke through marvelously. It wasn't that that God wasn't moving, but the the the, the people had so many layers of stuff that that we had to address. It just takes a certain amount of time. And when you're working bilingually, everything takes twice as long as normal. So some of those, you know, three hour appointments or four hour prayer appointments might have been done in an hour and a half or two if we'd been able to, you know, just work in that language. Let me ask you a question um, kind of around that, because I kind of know how, how, <clears throat> how you tend to do things and um I know you've done some of these in the past, but I think they're really connected with sort of a longer teaching. Is there a particular reason why you wouldn't do uh, more of a mass deliverance type of thing in these sort of scenarios, uh, as opposed to this intensive uh, one-on-one kind of a work? Because in every city we went, the number of layers that people had were so great. Um, the profundity of the ministry they needed was such that even though I tried doing a couple of mass deliverances and, you know, I mean, the room blew up, people weren't free just because we did a mass deliverance. We needed to go in and do some deeper surgery. Can you, can you speak a little bit more to that? Cause I think it's important for people to understand, uh, you know, because that, I think the popularity of that might be on the rise when it's all fine. They're all on the same team, but um, th- there is maybe a, a cause for us, maybe some reflection at least on why going to a service, going to a mass deliverance service with one of these folks, having the experience and leaving may not be all that's needed. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had conversations with people about this <clears throat> Um uh, we had Joseph Matera on this show a while back. He's a, a guy out of New York City, uh, former leader of the U.S. Coalition of Apostolic Leaders, U.S. Cal. Um, he's recently retired from that role and is uh, he's still in ministry. He's just not in that position now, still connected to the organization. So it was a good departure. <clears throat> but he and I had a conversation at one point about mass deliverance and, you know, he's done a fair amount of it in uh, his church resurrection church in um, Brooklyn, New York. And he has a, he has a significant pastoral concern that people who go through mass deliverance services don't always get the help they need. They're often left um, in need of more for lack of a better term. And, uh, I think sometimes people like the fireworks Um, and it's impressive for sure. It's impressive to see it, but the real question is, are we seeing substantive transformation and freedom? And I don't know that in, you know, every mass deliverance we might do, are you going to see a woman who's been a prostitute, a bisexual um, taking out all of her body art and throwing it away? or going home and throwing out all of the clothes that she used to wear when she was working as a prostitute. That could happen. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you often have to clear a lot of other stuff to get people to that place of freedom, that place of certitude that they don't want to go back. And so I think mass deliverance, I think it has its place, um, but it may not always be the answer. And pastorally, it it could potentially give people a partial solution rather than a full solution because they never really got completely free. Yeah. 
Well, and I, and I think too, it's important that people understand as we're talking about a, a trip full of uh, stops on deliverance and, and these intensive sessions and the teams being, you know, out, I mean, really what you're describing is yes, deliverance, but again, in this integrated healing model type of uh, ministry that is, is, you know, really highly associated with Orbis Ministries is how much of what you're doing is not just come out in Jesus name, but also, you know, discipleship and uh, why they should change them. And, you know, teaching someone this is, hey, you have to go get rid of these things. You have to go home and change, change your life, not just sort of a one and done uh, sort of approach. And I think that's why, for two reasons, honestly, I think that's why I've learned that there's a, a far higher success rate in uh, in this healing model uh, that that you teach, and that there it is uh, quite a bit more intensive and laborious than uh, maybe what people are used to. And so I think it's important is to help people understand what's actually going on on these trips because there, yes, there's deliverance, and yes, there's probably a tremendous amount of, of demons coming out, but there's there's discipleship and there's there's inner healing and there's pastoral care that's being given uh along with this and so it's i think it's important for people to have somewhat of a framework as we're talking about these sort of things um, yeah let, let me ask you another question uh unless you had something more you wanted to say i was just going to say that um i think sometimes in a large meeting of people uh, if you're going to do mass deliverance, what's useful is to identify, you know, this box, this little defined thing that you want to go after. So let's say, like in Romania, we're running into a lot of witchcraft. So we're going to do a mass deliverance from witchcraft. That means we're not doing deliverance on incest. Nor are we doing deliverance on drug abuse. Mm -hmm nor are we doing deliverance on LGBT issues. Those might all be there. Um, and we might decide having done one thing that we're gonna maybe take on a second one, but you have to be very targeted and specific. And when you give the altar call, all right, everybody who has in this example, witchcraft in your background, whether because you've consulted the dead or you've gone to the witch in the village or you, uh, you know, you may have used um, traditional herbal remedies that the witch provides, um, but you know that there was actually spells and incantations over the substances that you're ingesting. And so this is what we are going after. Everybody else do not come forward. We may do some more deliverance, but this is not your time. And if you come up and you say that you want deliverance from Freemasonry, we're going to say no. That's not what we're doing right now. We're doing this. I think if you get it very defined in just that little niche, that little box, uh, so that you can move the needle on at least one topic substantively, I think that can be a fruitful way of approaching that kind of thing. Sure. And I know, too, that a lot of times, at least in the things that I've been uh, around with you, uh, sometimes you'll t you'll pick a topic and you'll teach on it. And so there will be that teaching discipleship component, you know, leading up to that call for that specific targeted, uh, potentially mass deliverance type scenario. So um, I do know that that's, that's at least typically how I've seen you do uh, much of it. Um, let, let me ask you a question. You said something really interesting in, in one of the cities uh, that, that was named after Karl Marx. You said that uh, his spirit was around. Uh, we talked about this in the Romania uh, episode as far as uh, communism and deliverance. Did you find that the Marxism and, and deliverance, were those things interwoven? Was that necessary for what, what was taking place? Oh, yeah. Definitely. There, there are a lot of people in that city. Remember, it was named Karl Marxstadt. Um, there are a lot of people in that city who still carry that spirit. Um, it's still a stronghold of communism. Uh, they periodically will have unrest, uh, demonstrations, uh, people wanting to go back to communism, um, believing that capitalism is evil, um, I mean, all of it, it's all there. And so 
I wouldn't say it happened to every person in the meetings that we held in that city, but there were enough people who were getting delivered of communist spirits as well as the ghosts of Nazism too. We had quite a few people get, uh, you know, significantly impacted around Nazi type stuff. Uh, so that, that, it wasn't even theirs. It was their grandfather's. So let, let me pause on that because of some language that you use. Uh, you said, because I could see people keying in on this, ghosts of Nazism. Nazism. What, what do you mean by that? Well, this is the leftovers. It's the remnants of the Nazi regime. And in a lot of cases, the people that we were praying with were the grandchildren of people who had been uh, members of the Nazi party, SS officers, whatever. Um, one man we prayed with, his grandfather had worked in a concentration camp and had personally been responsible for the execution of Jewish people. And so there's blood guilt there and it's running in the family as generational iniquity. And man, when he manifested, I mean, it was no me there was no messing around with this. And, you know, he got delivered and, and he was kind of shattered by the whole experience because he knew what was in his family. But, you know, when the war ended in Germany, everybody just sort of went quiet and they just went home. Yeah. And so there, there was no attempt to to clean that up or to engage in any kind of meaningful reconciliation or repentance on a societal level. But you don't, you don't actually mean like Nazi ghosts, like ghostbusters. Well, I think there are spirits that are Nazi spirits. They are demons of Nazism, just like there are demons of, of, uh, of uh, communism. And for those people who are carrying those demons, I'm using the word ghost as a cipher for spirits, but I'm also kind of referring to the, uh, the collective recollection and consciousness of what n the Nazi regime was. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to curtail some of the rabbit holes that I can see people's mind going down uh, as we're listening to this uh, and just I'm being a little bit more specific. So yeah, yeah, for, that's fine. Yeah. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, well, so let me ask you this question, Ken, as far as you know, we talked about communism in the last one. We were talking about Marxism. These things are having uh, a little bit of a resurgence in pop popularity here in the West, particularly in America, as the context that I'm thinking about. Would you think that would be something to keep in mind as a minister here or as someone that is, um, you know, just around in in the ethos i mean is this something that that could be affecting people here even though there's not a generational thing associated with it oh unquestionably i mean all anyone needs to do is look up the name eugene v debs to see that there is actually a history of communism in america it never uh it never became the ruling political philosophy Although some would argue, and I, I don't want to turn this into a big like political screed. So just to be clear, I'm just pointing something out from a scholarly perspective. Um, there are some who would say that uh, the policies of the Democratic Party were uh, mildly communist, uh, even in the era of the New Deal under Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, but certainly as time has gone on, uh, many people have argued that uh, the, the Democratic Party has become more and more like the Communist Party over time. Not all Democrats everywhere, but enough Democrats that it flavors the Democratic Party. Some people have made that argument. Um, I would say, depending on who's saying it and how they're saying it and what documentation they provide, um, some have made that argument more or less convincingly. Um, so let, let me ask you this question then, like, yeah, you know, because, and and I know you talk about this more in depth in other places and, and particularly in your, uh, in school, but, you know, some of these things like the Masonic background and all of that can have, you know, pretty, uh, pretty frequent uh, maladies associated with it, problems, all of that sort of thing. But do you, do you see a connection uh, with these kind of political ideations and spirits to things that might be, you know, causing people discomfort or, or Absolutely. whatever? Yeah, unquestionably, yes. Because remember, these philosophies, both both Nazism and communism, you know, people say, well, Nazism is right wing and 
communism is left wing. Well, okay, fine. Um, most people don't even know what that means in terms of the differences, but here's what you know is true. Both Nazism and communism are godless philosophies. They are anti-God. And as a result, there are things that come with them in terms of their teachings, uh, what they do to a nation. Now, Nazism's only really been implemented on a societal-wide basis in Germany and Austria uh, in the Second World War. Uh, but when we look at communism, when we look at Nazism, uh, the things that go on in these systems are, uh, I mean, they're fundamentally immoral. They're immoral for all kinds of reasons, too. It's not just sexual immorality, although that certainly shows up in the behaviors of, of the people in these societies. Uh, they're immoral because they oppress and enslave people. Um, and they may enslave them because of their sexual orientation. They may enslave them because of their race. They may enslave them because of their religion, um, but they enslave and annihilate people. Um, the Nazis are responsible for the death of, uh, the, the numbers vary. I've read as low as 50 million and as high as 70 million people worldwide as a result of the collective activities of the Second World War. And keep in mind, the world was had a lot less people in it back then uh, than it does today. But within communist Russia, um, as a result of the policies of the Communist Party, starting in 1917 until the fall of the Iron Curtain in 1989, so that's a 72 year period, uh, more than 100 million people died in the gulag. And as a result of the policies, particularly of Stalin, but others as well, uh, other leaders as well, um, and in communist China, uh, the numbers probably are just only slightly below those of Russia. So maybe 80 to 90 million uh, have been slaughtered by their own government. And so um, communism everywhere it's been implemented uh, has no particular regard for life. In fact, it's very nature is a statist system um, that says the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And so there is a complete sublimation of individual rights to the policy goals of the state. Children are taken away. People are denied their religious liberties. They're denied uh, their economic liberties. And as a result, um, again, I don't care if we talk about the right or the left, the Nazis and the communists are no better than each other. Um, they and and capitalism left unconstrained uh, can easily become its own monster. I think capitalism as a system is generally better than communism or Nazism because it allows people to have their own means of self determination economically. But um, there have been books written uh, dealing with the uh, potential for abuse in a purely communist society, and this is why most capitalist systems have some form of regulation to just make sure that capitalism doesn't run wild and extract uh, undue economic uh, rent profit from um, from the societies where it's deployed um, so so then we what don't want a profit but but we can't let it we can't let it run wild yeah so so then can you give us an example just a quick quick example of someone comes up there they're suffering from from what that could be associated with this spirit of communism or marxism trying to help people draw the connection of how this can have real life implications well a lot of times people have um, digestive problems that's that's one of the common ones we see uh, mental health problems are common and in many cases these are not just what we typically think of as purely mental health they, they may have demonic activity that when the demons go they're crazy in their head goes with it um i'm thinking not so much of these meetings but of and others that i've held where we've driven nazi spirits out of people um oftentimes there's a deep-rooted racism that they don't themselves understand why is that there and it may run towards blacks, it may run towards Jews, it may run towards gypsies, 
um, could have a lot of these things because remember one of the key tenets of Nazism is Arianism, A-R-Y-A-N. Um, and I emphasize the Y because there's another word, Arianism, that has an I in it instead of the Y. That means something very different. That's an early Christian heresy. Uh, but Arianism is, is profoundly racist. And so uh, anybody who tracks that way um, very likely needs some kind of deliverance from that racist spirit. So these uh, are examples. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So I, I know we got to go here soon. Um, what, what are you, you got these two trips, um, you know, you're, you're back, back from them. Can you give us sort of a, you know, it, the tea leaves of the spiritual climate that you're seeing in, in the broader world, you're, you're obviously in contact with more than most folks uh, around more than most places. Uh, here we are. Um, it's March as we're recording this. And, you know, we're a little over a year from Asbury, a little over a year from all of those sort of things that we we talked about last year of happening, that convergence that we seem to, to see with the move of God. What are you seeing abroad and now and and here and there that you go? Are you are you are you finding this is increasing? Is it staying the same? Is it waning? What's the spiritual climate out there, Ken? Um it looks to me like Europe in particular has a lot of I don't I don't know if I want to call it revival yet, but I will say <laughs> there's some kind of a excuse me there's some kind of a resurgence spiritually going on people are waking up to spiritual matters uh no, this is not everybody all at once I've, I've said before that the distribution of revival and the distribution of the move of the holy spirit is like dark matter in the universe it's clumpy it's clumpy so uh there are hot, hot spots around europe where people are waking up um and they're you know, they're, they're wanting to do something and they want to stand up and be counted and they aren't just going to take what their governments may be trying to do based on godlessness. They're not just going to take that lying down. So this is not the same thing, by the way, as political activism, um, maybe of the sort that we see in the United States. It, it is a desire to stand up and be counted as a Christian and to make known to the society what the basis of Christian ethics is and why, therefore, many government policies are unacceptable. So it's not per se um, an uh, anarchy. It's not per se uh, seeking just to oppose government because we don't like the government and we think they're all scumbags. It is to say that they are uh, they're being counted with the idea of um, making a witness for Christ. And I think this is really what the confessing church, famously led by Bonhoeffer during the, uh, the Second World War, uh, Bonhoeffer and Niemöller and a few others, I don't wanna just make it sound like it's only Bonhoeffer. Uh, but anyway, the confessing church stood up to the Nazis and said, we cannot go along with what you are doing. We may have, we may have initially been enthusiastic for you, and they were, um, we may have initially thought you were had the best policies for Germany's resurgence, and they did. I mean, after all, it worked until the war started and then Germany got destroyed. Um, but we no longer can support you. We can no longer go along with, with all that you're advocating for, notwithstanding our previous support. And the reason is um, not that we're turncoats so much, but that we've never given up our loyalty to Jesus. And we now realize there is a fundamental conflict between your policies and our allegiance to Jesus. And our allegiance to Jesus triumphs over even our allegiance to you as our leaders in government. And therefore, we have to withdraw even at the cost of our lives. And for many of them, it did cost them their lives. No, that's good. That's helpful as we're sitting here. And uh in the West and wondering what's going on out there. So Ken, I know you've got a busy day ahead of you, which is rapidly approaching us. Um, and uh, you've been, this is our second recording of the evening. So uh, get some rest. Thanks for checking in. We look forward to uh, many more stories from the road. 
Uh, and if you like these kind of stories, Ken, I don't think we've talked about this en enough on uh, this podcast, but you also have a book that gives uh, an account of a lot of stories that went on, uh, on, a, on your missionary journeys uh, happening in Australia and beyond. But what's the name of that book? Where can people find it? Because it is like, I mean, page one, wild stories. <laughs> and it, it just doesn't doesn't stop. And uh, so they're all after, true. They're all true. They're, I've met several of the people in the stories whose names have been changed. I've met the real people yeah. and uh, they can confirm it. Um, so what's the name of that book? If you if you if you want to get get your hands on that, how can people do that? It's called On the Road with the Holy Spirit. And the subtitle is A Modern Day Diary of Signs and Wonders. Uh, I wrote the book. So by Ken Fish. It's published by Charisma. Um, I know Amazon carries it. I'm sure Barnes & Noble carries it. I haven't looked, but I'm sure they do. And I've had quite a few friends send me pictures of being in bookstores where it was on the shelf. So bookstores are stocking it. It came out in June, so it's not quite a year old. Um, but uh, yeah, go ahead and get a copy. It's It's filled not only with stories, but also with at least a theological rubric to help people understand how do these things really come about and how do we ourselves step into this kind of a lifestyle so that we have these experiences as well. And uh, I don't know, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm, uh, I'm hopefully going to get another book written sometime in the next year, but <clears throat> unfortunately my editor, her company was sold and she was she was allowed to moonlight and do some uh, work on the side. So she was editing for me. And she told me, I'm not going to be able to continue with this. Um, I've taken a new job with a new company. And I no longer have the time or the freedom to, uh, to be your editor. So I'm looking for somebody to help me in that task. And uh, I don't know. Like I said, it'll probably take a year to get that new manuscript ready. But I had hoped that I would have it to the to the publisher late in 24 but i can see already that's not going to happen because of the loss of, of this person so uh maybe in 25 we'll get the new book uh to the publisher and ready to go awesome awesome well, we look forward to that and i've i'm reading it haven't finished it yet you know honest i'll just be honest with you uh but i have i have been reading it and it's a it's a great read and so I uh, highly recommend picking that up. And it does, you do, you do a really good job of interweaving the theological points uh, along with the stories. And so it's, 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 uh, it's deep stuff, but it's entertaining as well. So pick, pick it up and uh, I'm sure you'll be happy you did. Ken, uh, thank you so much for taking time uh, to join us here uh, on another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. And thank you all for listening. We'll be right back this time next week with a piping hot episode right your way i forgot to mention one other thing yeah that go for it it's they can buy the book from orbis directly at orbisministries.org we have a bookshop online um, if they buy there we will ship to them and uh, we have plenty on hand and um, um, all the profit will go <laughs> to orbis rather than uh, some of it to the publisher so if they prefer to buy that way that's an option Excellent. So you heard it from the man himself. Orbis Ministries is the place to go. So thank you all for listening. We'll be back here next week. So long. If you are interested in exploring courses with us at Orbis School of Ministry, click on the link in the description of this podcast or go to orbissm.com. You can also send any school-related inquiries to our registrar, Joe McKay at joe at orbisministries.org. That's J-O at orbisministries.org.